So welcome everyone to our traditional, can you call it a traditional Wednesday <laughs> webinar? We've brought this one forward Seasonal. this month. Um, <laughs> The, la the last Wednesday of this month, it won't be a good time for anyone, right? So we've brought this forward to today and really appreciate everyone coming on. I can see we've got more people joining. I'm obviously joined by Zoe. Do you want to give everyone a hello, Zoe? Hello, everyone. Um, guys, can you just let us know in the chat box if you can hear us okay? Hey, Delia. Hey, Ross. Should be able to see a chat box to the right-hand side. Hi, Natalie. Good stuff. Eileen, Sally, Lisa, Ross. Hattie, Catherine, Karen, Susanna, nice to meet you all guys. Hey, Sharon, good stuff. Hey, Naz, just replied to your email, Naz. Um, all right, good <laughs> stuff. So let's crack on because there's a lot to go through today. So <laughs> as we approach the end of a very, very difficult year, we wanted to put together this, this short webinar where hopefully next year we're, we're hoping for less adversity and less change. And also we know the importance as employers that you're equipped to support your employees mental health next year. And, and, you know, we'll talk about this more in today's session as the session goes on. But of course, we've learned a lot from 2020, I'm sure. But hopefully what can we take from that moving into next year to really, really focus on transforming workplace mental health? We wanted to start with a couple of memes um, just to add a bit of lightness to <laughs> to today's webinar because, you know, let's be honest, 2020 hasn't been a very good a good year. First rule of 2021, never talk about 2020, right? Let's put that year to bed. And this scared me. What if 2020 is just a trailer for 2021? But actually, when we're looking at, you know, workplace mental health, we have to look at the year that's passed and question you know what have we done well what can we do better because it's still going to be a difficult year next year especially the beginning would you agree Zoe next year is going to be yeah. a difficult year still yeah d definitely I think well furloughs due to end isn't it at the end of March I mean people are already talking about redundancies and and, and planning for next year so I think I think it's going to be a different people plan isn't it definitely for for next year um and uh, and a challenging one I, I i assume budgets will be scrutinized like like never before because of all the the difficulties in, in in profitability that i think a lot of companies have had so yeah i think it will be just as challenging if not more so yeah yeah 100 percent, especially the beginning and that's kind of why we wanted to put today's session on so as always, thank you guys for joining. I'm Paul, the, the founder of everymind.work.com, also a mental health campaigner and speaker. I share my own personal story and my own personal experience of, of mental health and sadly losing my dad to suicide in the hope of, of helping others that, that might be challenged by mental health as well. And we're joined by Zoe. What's, what's, your, what's your introduction, Zoe? Um, head of HR of, of Every Mind at Work. And um, yeah, I'm really passionate about uh, mental health and, and well-being. And yeah, so that's me. We've done, we've done that so many times now. I feel like I we don't have to do it, but I feel like we have to, just in case we've got new people <laughs> just in case. joining today's session as well. So before we start, guys, using the chat box, what have you done to support employees during 2020? So think about what have you done differently? Um, from the work that we do, we work with just shy of 100 companies when it comes to supporting them with mental health. And whether that's via our app or via training or webinars, and we've seen a lot more innovation, I guess you could call it, when it comes to how we approach mental health. And we've also seen an acceleration of employers realizing the importance of it, especially as we all moved to remote working. We've definitely seen some more being done. So put it in the chat box, guys. What have you done? during 2020 to help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that first one. Signed up to your app, more staff engagement. <laughs> <laughs> and um, De Delio, you know, we'll pay you later for, for, <laughs> for saying that. Um, we've got trained mental health first aid. Our trained mental health first aid has created a wellbeing chat service for colleagues. Really like that idea. Oh. Um, Sharon says, both my colleague and I are now trained in mental health first aid delivering interactive mental health webinars, awareness and mindfulness sessions. Emma says we had staff trained as mental health first aiders, kept in contact. So I'm back to every mind as well. Good to hear. Um, Natalie, we have wellbeing ambassadors in Salford and have offered wellbeing chats to all of our staff throughout. Ross has delivered webinars across Europe, um, assisted in a, with a wellbeing policy, launched an employee assistance program, trained further 12 mental health first aiders. Good stuff, guys. That's really, amazing. really liking all of this. 
Yeah. Training staff on mental health first aid, implementing champion mental health employees, wellbeing strategy and policy. Um, and then finally, Nicola, regular communication during lockdown, staff survey to find mm-hmm. out how staff felt about returning to work and just offered a counseling service. So really, really good. And just I like that, Ross, mm-hmm. supported clients with strategies more than a tick box exercise, something that we'll definitely be discussing today. So Hopefully as well, guys, from those comments, you might get some suggestions that you can write down, potentially some stuff you can implement next year. But really what we're going to be focusing on in this session is what are some key strategies when it comes to next year. And if you stay on to the end of this webinar, we've actually put this all into a guide. It's a free guide that I'm happy to send you and you can get it as a free download. It's the 2021 Employer's Guide to Mental Health and we literally outline strategy and these key strategies plus more. So definitely at the end of this session, I'll give you my email for, for me to send you a free copy of this as well. So seven tips to help you transform workplace mental health. And of course, there's so much that you can focus on. I think that those mm-hmm. comments are a great sort of suggestion of that. You know, there's so much that you can do. And sometimes it becomes overwhelming, especially when you're being dragged from this to that place and you've got to do other stuff and there's lots of other responsibilities. Mm-hmm. You know, we're here to tell you to focus on mental health, but we equally know that there's so much that you need to be doing. So we really want to simplify this for you and highlight some of the key strategies that we've seen from our research and looking at those key seven tips. And number seven is really important. So you've got to stay to number seven. Super, super important. So um, number one, Zoe will will chime in on this as well. Um, Zoe will come at this from a HR point of view. I'm just going to come at it from a a passionate mental health point of view. So the the first strategy is ensuring you have viable support on offer. So for a lot of organizations, they did have supports. You know, for some organizations, they just had an employee assistance program, for example. But it's now during this difficult period that we've had to bring more awareness to it. We've had to create more communications around employee assistance programs. We've had to bring light to the mental health first aiders in the business. And we've had to almost innovate our communications in terms of how do we bring awareness to that. Um, I know from doing talks, lots of companies have it as posters in the breakout rooms and they have, you know, leaflets of the employee assistance program around the office. But with everyone working remotely, how do we communicate mm-hmm. to them and bring awareness to the, the support that we already offer? And I think that's been key and, and making sure that your, your almost toolbox that you offer your employees has been well thought of and you've got enough there for them to benefit from. Mm-hmm. Ensuring that the work environment and culture is supportive of discussing mental health issues. We're going to talk about this at another point, but really important we've started to look at chipping away at stigma. If possible, colleagues from the HR team, management as well, should be trained in spotting some of the signs and understanding what further support is available if needed. Again, one of the key ways is that top-down approach, which I'm sure we're going to discuss. Are your line managers, is your HR team equipped with how do they support people when it comes to mental health? And I really like this one as well. Peer support, buddying, mentoring programs can obviously be hugely beneficial and lots of companies are implementing champions again something that we're going to talk about as well so when it comes to support options there's so much that we can do um zoe in your experience within within hr have you seen a rise in more companies offering more support yeah and and i I think it's it it, the comms has uh, has been key as well i think what we've from the research that we've done we found that a lot of um eap programs have not been well publicized or they've only been used at a point where a colleague you know reaches a crisis point and it's been like helpline and that type of thing so i think this year more than ever companies have had to really over index on making sure that those messages are out there so if it is a bit of a suite of activity you know you you've got your eap but perhaps you're doing other stuff I think the comms have, have been so important because those those usage rates, I mean, we were finding were around sort of two to three percent um, of colleagues actually using it, which is which is awful when you think about it. So I think we've had to be quite innovative around what else can we do? It's not just it's not just an EAP. You know, let's get more visibility. Let's let's have open discussions. Let's build it into our review process. You know, n- n- whatever it might be, I think it's just getting that visibility and that comms and, and getting it to be 
more colleague led as well. I think if you've got things like, you know, start, um, employee forums, people forums, um, employee rep groups or anything like that, you know, let, empower them to, to sort of have it on the agenda and discuss it um, and really bring to the fore what is working and what isn't within our organisation. Because a lot of things are out there, but they're just not working or employees don't know about them. So I think I think I think the comms and and landing those messages and landing that education has been so so important this year. Um, yeah. You know, just as a starting point to, to build on more than anything else. Yeah, I agree massively. Again, one of the biggest challenges that we all face, let's be honest, is budget. And sometimes mm. we we have a budget problem when really we can make it very employee driven, which which kind of you know doesn't make it a budget problem anymore. Yeah. And you know, I think we'll talk about that more soon, but that's really kind of focusing on the culture and in empowering employees to talk more openly about it and be a part of of this. And and I think, you know, the reason why we say have more support is we all know how individual mental health is, right? You know, what helps me manage my mental health on a daily basis is going to be very different to what helps you, Zoe, and what helps everyone else. So really if we're even looking at how do we manage our own mental health, it's extremely individual. So if you've got, mm -hmm. you know, 100 employees, 1,000 employees, how they manage their mental health and feel supported is extremely individual and extremely different. So you can't just have one solution anymore. We move, we've got to move away from that now, that we have this one solution and that's the answer yeah. to, to everyone's mental health problems. You know, mm -hmm. we've got an EAP, so we're, we're covering mental health, right? We've got to move away from that now, um, especially moving into next year. So the more we can provide them, then the better it's going to be, surely. So yeah. um, definitely making sure you have enough support is really important moving into next year. Zoe, do you want to take number two? Yeah, yeah. So I think this the the whole environment and 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 the, we touched on culture, didn't we? But but even just the physical space, um, you know, obviously a lot of people have been working from home. But if people are sort of gradually getting back into the workplace, be that you know a, a factory environment in manufacturing or or be that an office environment, I think making sure those those factors such as you know things like natural daylight and um, you know the the temperature, etc. I mean, we we we've talked about that. That being um, that being so important, and, and especially if people have got physical symptoms, all of those things go towards you know a more conducive and effective working environment. Um, and, and I think that's definitely to, to be said for the layout and breakout areas, and you know whether you've got sort of hot desking environment. I, I, know, I know with all the COVID restrictions and everything, things like hot desks are probably a, a no no now. So I, I, I guess. Uh, filtering back into the workplace all of those risk assessments around how are we actually going to have people um you know spaced out if we if we are still doing sort of social distancing and all, and all that type of thing it, you know these these breakout areas and these quiet spaces are going to be even more important um to, to to make sure that the you know employees can get away if it is a noisy environment and, and you just need some thinking time that in itself can be a stressor having lots and lots of noise going on and people chattering around you so so making sure that you can get away you've got some quiet time and if it is sort of a you know an important piece of work or project that that, that you're working on you you do need that 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 thinking space um and the same goes for, for regular breaks as well i mean i, I used to be awful at this I, I literally would stay at my desk and you know eat, be eating a sandwich whilst we're still typing or, or, or whatever and unless somebody physically said come away and we'll go and get a coffee or whatever i i tended to work through my lunch which is such a bad habit so i think again Again, you know, leaders role modeling those behaviors are about getting away from your desk, having a proper break, um, you know, having a rest from from screen time, etc., which, which is obviously you know bad for your eyes. Um, but but it's a discipline, and it's uh, it's very it, it's very easy to fall into those bad habits. So it almost needs you almost need your peers around you and the leaders um, to encourage and almost make it a safe environment to do it you know you don't want there to be a, a culture of presenteeism and working through your lunch or, or anything like that so I think it's important that leaders do role model those behaviors and almost show people that it's okay to go and take half an hour or whatever you know you're not going to be frowned upon if you have a proper mm. lunch break or you have a coffee break in the morning or whatever it, it should be encouraged and, and as part of the culture because I think so much of this and we talk about you know breaking down the stigma don't we we talk about having you know candid conversations about our feelings and our vulnerabilities but I think if the culture isn't supportive of that you're just playing lip service to it aren't you you know you've 
you've got to visibly see things going on, hear things, um, and, and with other leaders and other colleagues role modeling those behaviors, I think people feel a sort of safer and more confident to you know to show those vulnerabilities or speak out if something's wrong so yeah, yeah all of all of that is so important definitely yeah and i think you know hopefully we're slowly moving more towards a shift away from almost this hustle culture you know i, yeah. I know i'm one that's very you know i fall into that trap where the way that i kind of deal with with my mental health sometimes is by overworking right that's just naturally mm. what i always tend to do but you know, I think we are still almost, we, we almost, you know, if, if we're, if we're not working, we feel like we're being judged or we're underperforming, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, if, if I say to everyone, Hey guys, I'm just going to go for like a, an hour and a half run during my day, there's going to be some fear that people are going to judge me or say, God, you know, why is he not working enough? You know, and all of this stuff. So yeah. definitely, as you said, leading from the top, and making sure that we're seeing people within the organization prioritize self-care and prioritize their their mental health which we all know that if you do that it can have a massive impact on output mm. as well but just just really kind of trying to encourage employees to do so and we've, we've seen yeah. some amazing stuff from organizations especially during this remote time because mm. you know from our data we're seeing distractions being the key challenge that, that most people are facing right now yeah and you know, encouraging that that switch off has been has been massively important. Yeah. So that's number two. Number three, and again, this is something that me and Zoe have both touched on: encourage communication about mental health. This obviously sounds easier than it is, right? Encourage yeah. conversation about mental health. Anyone can do that, but we we need to now look at it in more of a holistic, whole approach as part of an overall strategy, which we'll talk about rather than we are just going to do some comms around world mental health day right mm -hmm. we need we need to now move away from that we need to shift away from that and it's encouraging that open communication about mental health to to reduce that stigma um it's leaders being open about their own struggles mm -hmm. um honest honestly i've seen this happen time and time again with organizations where i've got in i've shared my personal experience and you can see that vulnerability almost encourages some of those employees to start potentially sharing what they're going through as well. But I will always, my, my impact won't be anywhere near a senior leader or someone high up in the business standing up and yes. sharing their story. That doesn't mean that my story is less important than theirs. It's just because this is someone that they work with, that they pass by in the canteen, that they put on yeah. this almost pedestal of here's someone who's high performing. They have no struggles. They have no vulnerabilities. And that person then puts themselves in a situation where they're vulnerable and it has this impact that creates more conversation. And at the same time, if leaders aren't willing to share how they feel, you know, they can still show compassion and encourage their team to, to talk about their mental health as well. Um, visible comms, I'm sure Zoe will elaborate on this as well, just making it more of a, a part of the culture. Mental health champions. And, and sort of well-being forums and well-being teams is, again, a brilliant mm. way of encouraging conversation. We've just launched a, a course, Every Mind Champion course, that we used to sell for £100 per head. We've just launched that for free. And if you guys want that, you know, feel free. I'll, I'll let you know at the end. Um, staggeringly, over the last 10 days, we've had 300 people go through that course. And now we have, you know, over mm. 300 champions out in different workplaces that have had some online training about supporting themselves, supporting others and creating a more sort of stigma free society. And the reason why we love champions is because it should not always fall on the shoulders mm -hmm. of HR. It shouldn't always fall on the shoulders of a senior leader or a CEO, you know, mm -hmm. let's empower everyone to champion mental health within an organization because it's something that we all have. Right. So that's something yeah. to definitely, definitely look at as well um and putting on events um, that don't lead sorry 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 go on no i was just going to say i'm, I'm being i'm being colleague led for for me that, that 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 again shows that culturally that that's just the way we do things around here and we're supportive of it and and again if you've got those champions you know within your people forums or well-being forums or, or whatever you set up for, for me that shows that you know the company is is sort of legitimately 
um, you know, putting putting that at the, at, at the forefront of what they're doing and allowing those those colleagues to sort of put suggestions forward and and take and take those solutions, um, you know, I, I guess own it and and, and take it forward a, a across the organisation. And again, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to you know come from leaders. I, th I think the more champions that that we can get across organisations, the more that a, a culture of well-being and, and sort of stigma-free conversations, I think that will become more and more embedded. I think that's such a, I think that's so powerful to, um, to you know, to get guys through that, definitely. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's, again, if it always comes from HR, as an example, you can get that sort of fatigue from those communications. Yeah. Whereas if you've got HR doing stuff about it, you've got maybe senior leaders doing stuff about it, and then equally you've got 5, 10, 15, 20, 50, however many people as part of a, a forum mm. and champion in it as well, you've now yeah. got more voices. And, and that's a yeah. much quicker way of changing culture than just you know one person doing it. So yeah. we, we're really encouraging that. Andrea, um, I think she's just left, but obviously we'll be hopefully sending out a replay of this as well. And then the last one that I put to this was put on events that don't lead with mental health and embed conversations in different ways. The reason why I put this in here is because I've been involved in various mental health events and you can almost kind of imagine that the kind of uptake isn't that high. Um, or I'm sure it's the same within your organizations. You might only attract the same amount of people, right? People that are more willing to join a session about mental health. So what a lot of companies are doing and a lot of charities and other events is they're embedding those conversations within other types of events. So yeah. um, I went to a, a charity night, I was a part of a charity night that it was a stand up comedy night. So people were there with their wives, their families, and you're there watching stand up comedy. And during that session, they then talk about male mental health, the suicide rates, the, the, the importance of it. And it was obviously a charity evening. And I often question myself then, I don't think half of this room would be here if it was advertised as a mental health mm -hmm. event, right? You're there because it's, it's advertised in a different way. So definitely with the webinars, with the events that you do, sometimes, you know, if they're more well-being focused or they're more sort of inspiring mm -hmm. focused or focused on something else, it can definitely attract more people in it and then embed more conversations around mental health as well. Yeah. Um, Ross says, I find we also have to destigmatize HR at times for some as they can be seen <laughs> yeah. as lawmakers. Yeah, that's a really good comment that Ross, because I was just thinking then when, when Paul was talking, there's a, there's a trust thing there as well. I've, I've often found over the years that um, if something again is colleague led and it's coming from a people forum or something, that there's that there's a lot more trust there. I'm not saying that you know that, that all leaders are distrusted or whatever, but there's there's sort of naturally a little bit of cynicism there. Whereas if if something is is promoted and really embedded by, by the colleagues, there seems to be more trust and more um, I guess more receptiveness really to you, you know to really getting involved. So no, that's a, that's a really good point. I think as well, you know, if you're looking at um, if you're looking at therapy, right? Therapy is so individual, like. I can go to a therapist and she, she could be amazing or he could be amazing and it could really help me. You know, Zoe could go to that same therapist, walk out and be like, well, that person's never going to help me. Right. It's such an mm. individual process. Whereas if you, yeah. you know, we're not saying we're therapists here, but if you're looking at an organization, you've potentially got a couple of people within HR, not everyone's going to be able to relate and feel safe and feel comfortable to mm. talk to those people. Whereas if you've now got 15, 20 others, you've now got more people that you know people can relate to and people may feel comfortable to talk to so it's really really encouraging that. and it, and and yeah. again I, I love mental health first aid and i've seen a lot of people say that but we do need to also think about instead of mental health first aid does just be in there which is then if you're in trouble go and see a mental health first aider which yeah. is still that reactive mindset which we're trying to move away yeah. from Instead, how can we turn those mental health first aiders into people that champion the business? But more importantly, what do we have in place for those mental health first aiders? So they are supported as well and they are mm. equally making sure that they're OK. So, you know, I think champions and, and as Zoe said, making this employee driven is, is very, very key. Yeah. Um, promote a good work life balance. Mm. So this is something that's banded around so much, isn't it? But I think I think 2020 
all the lines of of morphed and blurred and everything haven't they and we, we've had such a huge proportion of people that have been working from home so now when we talk about you know a healthy work-life balance um it's it it's so more important because possibly we are still at home we might be adopting more of a hybrid approach where you know part in the office part at home but i think i think those lines are so incredibly blurred now and and, and paul and i have sort of done sessions haven't we on working from home and and, and tips to sort of stay you know stay focused but it's but it's difficult so i think be that in a work environment or at home i think you've you've got to have those disciplines you've got to have those sort of um factors in place that mean that you can switch off and be that you know switch off from a work area or or, or literally walk away from your desk if, you, if you're in an office um and I think wherever possible, the whole sort of flexible working needs to be reviewed as well. I think I think sort of at one point we, we thought about flexible working as, you know, somebody just literally changing their hours and, and, and maybe sort of flexing that way. But I think it can be so many different things now, can't it? We've we've proven that we can work from home effectively in, in, in most cases. Um, but if we are starting to go back into the office again, I think as employers, what can we do? You know, can we flex start and finish times? Can we work more um, in, in a more agile way? I think for those of you that have worked in sort of, you know, tech environments, environments that, that that sort of agility piece is, is is quite at the forefront of the work that they do and they're focusing on outputs not hours worked but that but that's a real mind 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 sort of set shift isn't it to because i think traditionally we look at okay you know we've got some goals we've got some objectives we've, we've got kpis however we're measured um and it would be good if we could literally focus on those and, and be supportive of those outputs as opposed to you know clocking the the hours worked or being a bit pernickety about you know such and such a body's come in slightly late or such and such a body's gone home slightly early you know if that i guess if that helps them from a child care perspective or caring needs or whatever's going on um, in their life it's it, it's important and it all adds to, to to those feelings of positive well-being um and it's about leaders i think role modeling those those behaviors as well it goes back to the you know getting away from your desk having a proper break you know if, if leaders are, are, are literally you know, coming in at the crack of dawn and going home late, then colleagues could look at that and think, well, that that could be expected from me as well, and that's that's not a good that's not a good sign, really, is it? And it's the same for emails and things. If you're going to put some some things in place around, I don't know, I'm just plucking things here, but it, it could be like you know, no emails after six o'clock, or you know, leaders commit to not emailing colleagues over the weekend or whatever it might be, or you even have little out of office messages on there that say you know please don't feel obliged to apply you know to respond to this email i work at these hours because it suits me or so i, th I think it's it, it, it's having the confidence that you can flex your start and finish times. You, you you should be able to feel confident about focusing on outputs and not focusing about clock watching. But it's but but that sort of um, empowerment and uh, and that um, I guess permission to do it has to be role modelled by those by those leaders as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think there's the, 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 a similar thing from um, from a, I guess a work allocation perspective. You know, if if work is being allocated by leaders, again, is is that value add work? Are we just sort of piling everything on and just hoping that you know somebody will will rattle their way through it? But I think that prioritisation piece is going to be so key next year. And can we really look at that and say, do you know what, we do this because we've always done it? But is it the right thing to do? Is it adding a lot of value or could we actually stop doing it? Could we pair back on it? You know, from a profitability perspective, what are the things we should be focusing on strategically to get the most value, the most profitability out of the business? And can we stop doing some of those non-value add tax tasks that, that maybe employees are just plowing through because it's what they've all, always done, but nobody's really questioned it? Mm. And, and I think, you know, back to the whole you know employees suggesting new ways of working 
again, if you have that people forum environment, you know, why why don't they have a look at new ways of working? Why, why don't they sort of suggest that, you know, in our teams, this will work for us? Because not, not everything is going to be applicable to every team. But, you know, if you are in a team of people, you may, may be doing cross-functional working, you may be wor working in agile, you know, tech teams, if, if it's that sort of environment. And, and, and very different ways of working may suit those those types of team environments. But I think it's having the confidence, isn't it, to, to raise it with the leaders and say, can we try it this way? I know we've always done it this way. And in theory, it might be working OK, but we think it could work better by doing X, Y and Z. Um, and as long as leaders are receptive to those conversations, then I think it, it, it can be it can be a benefit because I think over these next few years, we're going to see so many different ways of working, so many different um, opinions of what flexibility means to to, to, to one another. Um, and, and yeah, it's going to mean completely different things depending on, on your, your, your own scenario, the work that you're doing. So what 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 is fit for purpose for one person isn't necessarily going to be fit, fit for purpose for the yeah. rest of the team. So I think it's recognizing that, isn't it? And being, um, yeah, being being mindful that um, that different solutions are going to be needed going forward. Yeah. And I think, again, it, it does come back to that, as you say, that individual tailored approach. Not everyone wants to do a nine to five. Some people want to do a, a 10 yeah. to four because then or a 10 to a 10 to five because then they can do the school run you know in the morning yeah. they can take their kids to school um yeah. you know we need to move away from kind of money being the only motivation and career you know success being the only motivation for people and, mm. and understand that everyone has a different approach i think as well just a couple of things you know overwhelm from you know tens of thousands of people that use our app anonymous analytics are coming through and when it comes to work we're seeing overwhelm be the number one sort of yeah. issue that we're seeing when it comes to the work sort of element of it and even though lots of our employees are feeling valued by their company and feeling supported by their company overwhelm certainly is very high now again is that because they're working from home and they take on more than they believe that they can do they feel like they've got more hours who knows but we definitely need to keep an eye on that and and just yeah. finally i think like you said freedom right this is this is why flexibility is so key because mm. freedom is a, a psychological need that we all chase, right? We, we all want to be free, whether that's financially free, freedom from our career, freedom from emotional freedom, right? And let's be honest, these last however many months, we've had a lot of freedom taken away from us, right? So, mm. so our need and our desire for more freedom is even higher. So so I definitely think, you know, a lot of a lot of employees will want that flexibility and they'll want their employers to, to be more flexible yeah. as well. Um, conscious of time, guys. Um, number five, listen and learn from employee feedback. You know, during this difficult time, I think a lot of this has been communication and then not listening for a lot of organizations. So we need to remember, you know, communicate, listen, learn. Every employee is different. Trying to find that one size fits all approach is, is going to be impossible instead you know understand the importance of listening and learning from employee feedback again if you've got that well-being committee those champions that's another way of gaining that feedback regular pulse surveys around mental health and well-being finding out how you can support um, your employees i think as well if engagement is low on comms i've heard this many times before we've been putting stuff out about mental health but no one's really replying no one's really engaging i, I would not see that as a negative you know it takes a lot for someone to reply to something to do with mental health, right? So again, if you're putting out comms and you're creating more communication and you're trying to create that conversation, what I found is who knows, I might read the email that you send out as your employee and I might go, hmm, that makes sense. I'm not gonna reply to that email, but in three months time, when we're doing an event about mental health, I might now feel comfortable to talk about my story and that's all come mm. from that one email that you sent out three months ago so definitely you know don't worry about engagement this is about just trying to embed it more within within the year and again as we said get champions and well-being um, forum to get those feedback from employees the key thing that we do with every client is let's listen what is it that's 
your employees are saying? What's the data that we've got from your organization that's anonymous, but where are the areas that they need more support? What can we do to learn from that and then embed that into a strategy? Because trust me, every organization is different. Every employee mm. is different. And I think listening and learning is key. Um, Zoe, I'm going to go on to number six. Yeah, so... I think I think by incorporating, um, you know, real sort of mental health awareness and, 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 and targeted sort of training around, you know, it could be sort of resilience or mindfulness or self-esteem or, or, or those types of things. I, I think that's something that probably historically is is not in a normal suite of uh, of sort of L and D offer offering. So I think I think having all the good stuff that we've talked about in the mental health first aiders and you know you might have different programs and and, and different sort of activities. But I think really having a different focus on on some of the training that is offered could be could be hugely beneficial. Um, I, and I think it would give managers, it, it, it would give sort of colleagues more confidence as well. So I think it, it's all very well sort of talking about you know people being trained to spot signs or give advice, but what does that training look like? And it might it might not just be um, you know specifically on uh, targeting mental health signs or or things to, to, to look out for. It might be building up your own well-being and it might be things like resilience or self-esteem or, or all the things that you might need as a person supporting other people. So I think the more those types of things are, are introduced across companies and, and, and they're offered, for, for me, again, it, it benefits that whole sort of cultural piece and reinforces the messaging around, you know, we, we genuinely care and want to promote a, a culture of well-being and and that is a, a continual thing it's a preventative thing it's a proactive thing whatever you want to call it it's not a reactive thing so I think allowing colleagues to almost like pick some of the tools and and, and 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 sort of services to use you know what would what would benefit them everybody learns differently and and some people like face to face some people like on you know online some people like sort of going away and, and reading things so I think having different solutions and, and possibly different mediums and mechanisms for, for doing that would be really beneficial um, and but but trying to trying to sort of have that on a continual basis as well. I think I think it's great to have you know a well being um, a well a wellness week or a well being day or, or that type of thing. But is that something that's going to be repeated? It's not just going to be once a year because again, if it's something that's that people see repeated. It, it will embed it sort of far far quicker, far more effectively. And again, it supports that cultural piece around this is just the way we do things around here. You know, we are supportive of well-being practices. We're supportive of, of having a proactive approach, not just a, a one-off seminar or one-off wellness week. Um, it's just the way we do things around here. So I think having it as part of your strategy um, and whatever those steps are, as long as you're taking steps to Towards building on that strategy, then it's it's got to be it's got to be a positive. Um, and I think it's better to it's almost better to take baby steps and, and get some feedback on it than it is to sort of launch a great big um, piece that that might not resonate or, or or might not hit the mark. I think one thing I've observed over the years is that if you sort of guess what colleagues want, it, it, it it's often inaccurate and and when you actually drill down into what are they looking for and you get some real you know real real sort of rich data from either an engagement survey or, or you're having those conversations often you can be quite surprised about some of the feedback that you get so i think ultimately that this this needs to be a supportive program and if employees are telling you that you know that they that they don't want a helpline they want mental health first aiders or they don't want online courses they want a people forum where you talk about things or whatever whatever it is that they're telling you i would i would strongly suggest that you at least trial it because i think if you if you ignore it and it's almost a tell culture of well we think that we need an eap or we think that we need this and then actually it doesn't land it doesn't resonate the usage rates are really really low then you know not only have you wasted time but you've possibly wasted money as well when they what mm -hmm. they wanted was was something quite different so I think it's back to your point, yeah. Paul, is about the comms and the feedback and the listening and, you know, and acting on that feedback. 
but the more yeah. the more mechanisms that you've got to collect that feedback be it via you know surveys conversations you know well-being you know people forum whatever it might be use that data to then build on on your strategy and and and, and be flexible with what you do i think as long as um you know you're not tied into something for a, i don't know three year period or whatever where you've you've spent all your budget on one thing you know hopefully you'll have that flexibility um in house because a lot of those things aren't aren't even going to cost any money anyway um but make sure you're focusing your efforts in the right places yeah yeah and i think with with this point you know education is so key right and none of us are really educated on mm -hmm. on mental health so so this is where i think you know incorporating it into kind of L D programs is key and just just you know, I remember when I was in my lowest, like the walls closing in on you, not really knowing what to do, not really knowing how to feel better. You have this toolbox, right? That's very limited. Like my toolbox was, was you know, let's drink some alcohol, let's get angry, let's overwork. Mm -hmm. You know, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and spend some money. Like that was my toolbox of how I'm going to deal with my emotions. When you have the education, you then realize, hold on. I've actually got a much bigger toolbox now, mm. you know, whereas it's, it's therapy, it's um, journaling, it's speaking to people, it's work that's meaningful. It's, it's this much bigger toolbox now that I've got. And that's only come from education. And I mm. think, you know, people need that education as part of this. And, and I think as an employer, there's this huge reward if you can, if you can offer that too. Um, yeah, so totally agree. And then finally, tip number seven, um, this is one thing that we wanted to focus on and and also tell you a little bit about as well. Focus on strategy. Now, this sounds quite simple, but, you know, I've been doing this for a couple of years now. And whether it's companies like Lloyd's DS, TSB, Warner Brothers, companies like that, whoever I work with or smaller companies, I've, I've always seen a lack of strategy. Like if, if you if I asked you, why are you why are you doing mental health first aid? Where does that fit within your strategy? there's still this lack of strategy, right? And and it's almost like we're doing this because we feel like it's the right thing to do, but actually there's no strategy and meaning behind why we're doing this. Where are we trying to get to? How are we trying to move culture? So when it comes to strategy, for too long we've, we've seen mental health as this issue that isn't complex. And it's something that I can look to Zoe to and say, hey Zoe, you know, you're in, you're in HR, can you help us boost staff morale? Right. And, and that's literally the I way that we've approached. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's the way we've, we've approached it. Right. Um, I know what we're going to do this year. We're going to do a talk on mental health awareness week. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's really going to push the needle for mental health. Is it, you know, we, we struggle to even manage and comprehend yeah. our own mental health, let alone, you know, all of our employees and culture and, and yeah. everything else. And, I think we're now realizing the complexity of it. And this is just a screenshot that I've grabbed from one of our trainings. You know, if you're looking at work and the impact of work on someone's mental health, right? And you're looking at all of these different factors. Firstly, you've got the individual, you've got their age, you know, the generation they were brought up in, their coping styles, their gender, their values, their personality, the decision making. You know, that's just one small segment of this. And you've got the job characteristics, the role characteristics, their relationships, the way they communicate, the way they deal with conflict. And what we then have to also remember, this is purely just work. If we expand this out and we account for relationships, you know, we account for past trauma, we account for everything else. We're now looking at the complexity of mental health. And, and here we are as an organization, putting trust in just having some mental health first aiders to really change culture. You know, we need to be doing a lot more about it. And, and hopefully, as you've seen, this isn't a, sometimes, this isn't always a budget issue. It's just a strategy issue. There, there isn't enough strategy there. And I want to share this with you. And, and this is something that we've been working on now for a while. And it's something that you can obviously take away, but equally, if you do want some more advice on this specific to your organization, we'll let you know. But, the, the strategy that we've kind of looked at and developed is the three P's, um, promote, provide, protect. Now, the three P's, the three pillars, are typically every organization needs to focus on all three. But different organizations at different times will need to focus on one pillar more than the other two. Now, Zoe, I'm sure you can relate to this from your experience. You know, how long have we just focused on protect, right? So you've worked for some big organizations. Yeah. I'm sure for a lot of those companies, they just had 
you know, protect employee assistance program. If someone's yeah. in crisis, this is what we do, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we need uh, to move the, away from that, right? Yeah, yeah. And and, and, the, and we've said all the way through this, haven't we, that like that culture has to be, you know, that sort of thread, that sort of blue that hangs it, you know, hang, holds it all together. Um, but yeah, so, so often I think it's been skewed towards protect and that, well, we've got an EAP or we've got a helpline or we've got, you know, reactive counselling. Um, but having a holistic well-being strategy that that might be a wing of, of of your people plan your overall you know people strategy or in fact your you, you know your overall company strategy if um you know if, if you're in a smaller organization but the, it's definitely been skewed towards protect um yeah yeah and i think that's, that's that's it's it's fine right because you know we're, we're all learning still and, and let's be honest how do we deal with our own mental health we're still mm. very reactive you know we wait until we are in a bad place to then start doing something about it, right? We're still very reactive of how we deal with it. And, and from an organization business point of view, of course, you're gonna go straight to protect because if someone's in crisis, we wanna make mm -hmm. sure they're okay. But what we've missed for so long is the promote and the provide part of this, the, yeah. the prevention, right? So what are we doing to promote and create that open culture? What are the evidence-based interventions that fit within promote that you as an organization need to do? Then equally, what do we need to do to provide, which is your proactive support? It's your development, your, as you say, your L&D programs, your, your workshops, your line management mm -hmm. training, and all of that that focuses on more a proactive approach. And then we do need our protect still, because you can do so much as an organization and you will still get people that might be in crisis, because as mm -hmm. we've seen, mental health is so complex, something can happen and they could be in dire need. You've still got that. You still need to focus on that. But what we're trying to move organizations to is let's not neglect, promote and provide and go straight to protect because that's what we've yeah. done for so long. Yeah. The model is not working, right? <laughs> the model is not working. We need to do um, something different. So really, when you're looking at those three pillars, you know, take that away. But as we've said, every organization is different. And what interventions work best within each pillar is very specific to your organization. So um, if you guys want to find out a little bit more about that, we're happy to, to kind of let you know more about the strategy. Um, happy to kind of jump on a call with you to find out a little bit more about the organization and obviously how those three pillars work. Um, at the same time, as I say, our role is, as the business is mental health partner for a lot of organizations, whether you're um, an SME or whether you're a bigger organization, we're really looking at taking that more proactive approach to, to almost revolutionize workplace mental health. So if you want to jump on a call, find out a little bit more about that, guys, um, you can go to this link here, which is everymindatwork.com forward slash inquire. The majority of what we do is driven by our app it's an accessible app mm. for all it takes a proactive approach it's branded to your business it's anonymous for the employees so it kind of allows them to feel free to use it, it sits on their own personal devices but the key thing there is obviously we're gaining that insight and that anonymous analytics to provide back to you and then from our experience and our team we can offer you some interventions some training etc focusing on those three pillars and for the next 12 months however long the relationship lasts, helping you with that strategy. And I'm sure, um, Zoe, from your experience, when you've got strategy, you end up not spending as much money or, or losing time because everything is, is built into the strategy, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think just having that, that, that focus, it's, um, you know, if, if you've got something build it, built into your overall people plan, you know, you, you've got well-being as a wing, but then it, it focuses on, you know, that, that proactive sort of pre preventative measure. Um, I think it's it, it's got to be a benefit. I think as soon as you move away from just the the, the reaction we protect, um, it's it, it's got huge benefits, and it also supports anything else that you might be trying. You know, if if you are trialing mental health first aiders, or or or, or, you, or you're trialing sort of I don't know different well being initiatives. I think if that is part of your strategy, and you get that sort of senior leader buy in, um, and and that people are in agreement that that's something that that should be promoted promoted from a you know from a company perspective then from a strategy sort of perspective it should all hang together 
Um, yeah. You know, it shouldn't be viewed as oh, oh, this is a mental health strategy. You know, it should be a well-being strategy and and something that's continual, that's um, that, that that's really preventative. I, I think that's that, that's the key for me, isn't it? That that yeah. um, it's it's not just reactive. That that you build it into the practices. You you have it as a thread, really, and and it could be something that you build into. I don't know your check-ins, your reviews. You know, rather than just talking about okay, you know what what goals have you achieved in the last couple of months or whatever you know you 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 have those or you encourage those well-being conversations and I think if line managers feel confident and are sort of trained and coached in having those conversations again it becomes more natural it becomes more um more genuine really and again it's not just sort of ticking the box or paying lip service to it it's 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 exactly. a thread throughout your people practices definitely yeah and i think if you if you come back just quickly and you're looking at those three pillars you know if you've got typically let's say 100 people in the promote stage and you're focusing there potentially you know you then might only get 30 40 people in now the provide stage that need that more proactive support and then if you can provide that as well you then might only have you know a small amount of people fall through to the protect stage if you completely eradicate promote and provide and you've just got protect you're going to have so many more people eventually yeah. falling through to there you know we all know in mental health that sometimes it's that ticking time bomb so so really it's kind of as you say encouraging that prevention um thank you shirley as well shirley says the app and webinars from every mine have been really good for opening channels within our company during difficult times and set a benchmark for the future really really appreciate that so if you guys want to obviously find out a bit more about that whether it's jumping on a call to talk about the strategy or whether it's finding out a little bit more about the app um just go to every forward slash inquire just fill out the form and then we'll be able to, to book in a call for that as well. And the key thing for us is, like I said, providing that accessible support. But as you can see here, providing you with a dashboard that allows you to track what we call your every mind score, looking at resilience, good mental health, job satisfaction, general well-being, and workplace well-being. This is how your score looks as a company um, mm -hmm. based upon the data that we're getting from the app. But at the same time, um, this is what the average looks like. This is what it looks like within your industry. And, and how can you track that over the next 12 months to see if the work that you're doing is having an impact? Like I say, there's still so much guesswork when it comes to, to mental health in the workplace. And again, here's another screenshot from the dashboard that looked at the six pillars that we track when it comes to our app, which is connections, lifestyle, self-belief, work, mood and anxiety and worry. And you can see the areas where you're doing well and the areas that you need to improve, right? So even in work even though this company has doing well as their score you might not be able to see it but in the red it says um can feel overwhelmed with work so the key there with the data that we've got is employees feel overwhelmed mm -hmm. so when you are now creating initiatives when you're putting on webinars when you're thinking about what's next you know the key challenge so you can obviously provide some support there so as zoe said there's been too much guesswork for too long and, and one thing that we're trying to move away from is, is provide you with that, that support. So definitely, guys, if you want to, as I say, book a free strategy call, if you want to get a demo of the product, um, just go to everymindatwork.com forward slash inquire. If you do go to that link before, um, if you go to that link before the end of this year, you're going to get three months free access to the app and the platform as well. So all you need to do is, is go and um, fill out the form before the end of the year and we'll give you three months free access to the platform as well. Yeah. So, guys, um, like I say, go on, go on, sorry. <clears throat> No, I was just going to say as well, it's, it's probably worth mentioning, Paul, that, that all of this is is sort of, you know, backed up and, and, and sort of validated um, by our in-house psychologists. So this, this, this is the, all the research or all, all the sort of content um, is is either created or checked or validated by um, by uh, Dr. Lauren Callahan, our, our psychologist. So I think it is important just to, you know, we, we, ha we have that sort of professional um, backing as well. It's, um, it's, it's not just sort of... Uh, uh, Paul and I taking uh, <laughs> taking taking a punt on what oh, we Paul, what Paul we in his living room with the really annoying yeah. Christmas tree that flashes way too much, right? Um, <laughs> so, so guys, do you have any questions at all? If you have no questions, just put no in the chat box. Otherwise, me and Zoe sit here looking at each other. Um, but hopefully, this has been valuable. Definitely, we'll send out a replay as well. And like I say, if you guys want the guide as well, then just drop me an email. My email is there, Paul at everymindatwork.com, and we'll be able to send you the PDF. Um, version of the guide as well which will basically outline everything that we've gone through today plus more and it can be a resource there for you um, to do so as well good stuff Emily Emily's calling as soon as possible um, 
no worries thank you guys good stuff in the meantime we won't be doing another session until january now end of january so um merry christmas <laughs> that's yeah. really weird saying that does, um, <laughs> merry christmas to you all and um like i say hopefully you have a good christmas and we can see this year out and hopefully we'll have a more positive 2021 yeah. um sharon just quickly to answer your question sharon um we our pricing model is very different to a traditional eap as well where we don't typically charge per employee um we charge more or part and how can we support you over the next um throughout the partnership so sharon if you reach out we'll be able to give you a, a quote on that as well but we would say that that we're, we're very affordable is the right word um you know <laughs> and and the reason why we are is because we're all very very passionate hopefully you can tell by by you know mental health and, and trying to support people and we don't think it should be out of budget as well so yeah sharon reach yeah. out if you fill out the form on in that link um then we'll be able to, to help you with that no worries good stuff all right guys thank you so i appreciate it as always and um we'll see you all next year have a great christmas guys thank you